Hi everyone and welcome or welcome back to Painless Pages. Today's video is one of the most requested video on this channel. It's how to answer English literature A-level questions. I have already done a video on answering GCSE questions and that one has an example of poetry. So today in my A-level video, I want to focus on prose. This video is split into three main sections. So the first one is assessment, assessment objectives. The second one is preparation. And the third one is actually writing the response. In the answering section, I will also give you an example essay centered around the response that I wrote comparing two works. And the video focuses on Ed Excel's objectives primarily because that's the exam board I used to do my A-levels. But I know that a lot of this is applicable to other exam boards. So I hope that even if you're doing another exam, you will still find this video useful and we'll stay straight in. All right, so this is the part that is probably most specific to an Excel, but most exam boards focus on several things, which is how you write your essay and what you write in your essay. So there's definitely some overlap. It's just the way that these assessments are balanced in their weighing that makes the difference. So in Edexcel, there are five main objectives that you should know. So AO1 is how you actually write your essay. Essentially, this objective centers on how you write your essay, the quality of your argument, and how you convey your argument. And some people say that it's not, it's not how you write it what matters, it's what you write. And that's not really true for A-levels. So really, I talk a lot about this and structuring the essay in my GCSE video, but essentially the rule of thumb is to make sure that you have a clear point, give clear evidence, and link it back to the question. And about quotes, for A-levels the demands are far stronger, so you need to actually pick suitable, uh, suitable quotes. And ideally you don't just pick three, but you use as many as possible without using a quote every other sentences, so quotes that you actually need. This objective is actually really easy to achieve if you plan well, which is the next section of this video and essentially the key point to remember is when you make your argument make sure that it flows well and that there's a logical chain and that you're actually explaining things even if they seem obvious to you and that's basically what this objective is all about assessment objective two focuses on your actual argument, your evaluation. This is essentially the E part of the P-E-E-L structure, and it focuses a lot on what you're actually saying. It's the substance of your essay. Your essay needs polish to be nice, to be easy to read for the examiner, but your essay also needs substance. And AO2 is all about assessing your substance. Why are why did the writer choose this particular word? Why is this important? Why does this answer the question? And I think that last part is most important of all. Your point should always, always answer the question. And not the question that you think is being asked, but the question that the exam is actually asking. Assessment objective three is actually the context. A writer's work is very much a product of the writer. It doesn't come from nothing. Different exam boards look at how much to value this differently, but essentially you need to look at the way that a certain period influenced the writer or the way that their personal background influenced the work. Um, this is again balanced in different exams to different extents, but in the prose exam, which we're talking about today, this one is particularly important. You can't talk about Beloved without mentioning the fact that it's about slavery and the legacy of slavery. And likewise, you can't talk about Dracula without realizing that it's a process of xenophobic Victorian prejudices and the attitudes towards foreigners without which this book wouldn't have had the impact that it originally had. So AO3 focuses on context. and it's also very important how well you integrate this context because you shouldn't just be throwing it at the end and saying you're done. Rather, it needs to be an integrated uh, context, contextual, there needs to be integrated contextual detail all through the work. AO4 comparison. So this bit is very specific to the Edexcel exam, but I know that in a lot of the A-level exams, there is a comparison between different works. So when I say comparison, people usually think of just the differences, but that's not really what a comparison is about. It's both about similarities and differences. You don't need to just say that a work is different from this work because, I don't know, this work revolves around 
a dead child and this work revolves around a vampire. Uh, that's not exactly how it works. In fact, it's better to do an integrated approach when you're comparing works and when you're comparing to pick an overall theme and an overall point. So rather than saying this book has this, so does this book, you need to make sure that the points and the examples and the similarities and the differences you find are all connected to the question you have and we will take a closer look in the answering section. And finally, AO5 interpretation. In fact, this assessment objective is particularly important for uh, the drama paper and Shakespeare and critical interpretations of Hamlet or whichever strategy you're studying or comedy. But um, this work, is, this assessment objective is all about showing that you're not just self-centered, that you also understand what critics are saying uh, and the ways that this is important. So you need to understand that the writer is not just just writing for you, but for an audience, right? And that different people have different ways of interpreting it. And also, particularly in drama, you need to realize that it's not supposed to be read as a book, but it's supposed to be performed. So interpretations also play a role. And in fact, um, although it's not a particular focus in the prose paper, it would be good to consider the, the critical acclaim and the critical reception of these works, although it's not prim the primary goal. But anyway, let's move on to plan the planning bit is actually just as important as writing the essay and the way that your essay will turn out the outcome is heavily dependent on the planning and planning starts first of all with the limitations on time for the prose paper you have 75 minutes and in fact you have to write an essay on comparing two works and it's out of 40 marks within those 75 minutes you need to realize that you these is, this is 75 minutes of not pure writing time, but writing and planning. And I personally never feel guilty about taking five minutes to plan. And even if I overrun and end up using seven minutes, I think that's more important because it's the beginning foundation to having a good essay. And what I like to do is I like to first of all think of think about two questions. You always have an option of, with regards to your two questions and you need to think really carefully about which question to choose. It's often this is half of my planning time is spent on thinking which question to choose because when you think of which question to choose there are several factors to consider first of all you shouldn't be choosing a question that is too sophisticated and you don't fully understand because that might mean that your essay is not in fact answering the question the second thing is of course to not be answering a question where you don't have much to say even if you think that the question is easy because you need to show that you have an interesting approach and that you actually have points that meet all of the assessment objectives and finally it is of course to really make sure that in the question that you choose there is a room for you to meet the assessment objectives so those three points are really critical and after you choose your question what i like to do is i like to write the question on the top the question that we're using today for my example essay is compare the ways in which the writers of your two chosen texts make use of symbolism what i do then is i on the left hand side write one novel on the right hand side write the other my two chosen novels were beloved by tony morrison and dracula by Bram Stoker. After that, I try to think of three thematic points that link to the question and that I can use to compare both works and the ways that both works makes use of symbolism. And the first thing I do is I think of broader points that I can give. So the points that I had here was first of all symbolism to distinguish characters as the other, second symbolism to, refer to reference abstract ideas and help advance the narrative, and third symbolism to draw attention to poignant moments. And I didn't choose these points for nothing, I chose them specifically because I knew that in, in for example the point about distinguishing characters as the other I could bring in context and the point about abstract ideas and themes I could use to particularly talk about language and similes which is therefore about evaluation and about the writer's craft right so when you choose your points make sure that your points really do tie in with the objectives and the other important thing to remember is to when you pick a point when you pick a question stick to it don't change your mind halfway through because you will not have time and that hesitation <laughs> I like to have a saying that um, I think examiners could smell the fear on the paper so don't let yourself be daunted by the question once you've actually committed and just do your best to really drive your point home whatever your point is. 
once you've decided on your points, I then jot down one example for each novel. And if I, oh, I obviously have other examples, but I write down the one which I think is most important, and I also write down one which I think I might forget. And for example, with the point about the other, I wrote that in Dracula, Mina's mark on her forehead, it shows that she's not pure anymore, and I tied that into ideas about purity and the fallen woman, and again, context. And in Beloved, I of course wrote about Sethi and the charity on her back marking her as a former slave. So even though she she's now a free citizen, she will never not be considered as a slave, because of the scars on her back which mark her out and also because of her status as the that one woman who who killed her child you might be wondering why i have three points uh is it a rule no it's not a rule um it's just that you need to have a broad range that makes sure to cover all objectives and I personally have a habit of getting carried away and giving overly detailed points, so my one point can be a solid two or three pages. So my points are very detailed, so I don't personally go for the five point structure, and I don't stick with two because I think it's too, too few. So I would recommend three as long as you give sufficient detail, but if you don't give sufficient detail, then of course like four or five is all right. It's not a hard steady rule, but also in one hour, 15 minutes, you should not probably be making five points. <laughs> like I feel like it's too big of a time constraint, so if you're properly developing it, it should not be more than three or four. All right, answering. The first thing I do after the planning stage is I draw a line underneath to make it clear that the above is like my just my planning process, it's my thoughts. I don't cross it out because I think it's helpful for the examiner to know what the planning process was, but I don't spend a lot of time making the plan look neat or trying to explain it a plan is for you. A plan is not even assessed by the examiner. It just, it might like subconsciously help in some way, so I don't think keeping it does any harm, causes any harm, but yeah. So after that I draw a line and underneath I write the title of the question. So compare the ways in which the writers of your two chosen texts make use of symbolism. And after that I write my actual essay. So I will read the essay and after each kind of paragraph, I will stop and talk about what's wrong with it. So this is, by the way, just a disclaimer, this is not a perfect essay by any means. Uh, this is an essay I wrote after a long break from writing essays. It's the first essay, it's one of the first essays I wrote after almost like half a year of not doing anything. But it did score in the top bands and I chose this essay specifically because I know it's not perfect and I know I wrote better essays than this. And it's kind of to show that as long as you meet the assessment objectives, it doesn't need to be a masterpiece. It doesn't need to be perfect. So. Yeah, let's dive straight in. In both Beloved and Dracula, symbolism is frequently made use of by the writers in order to draw the reader's attention to prominent themes and messages. Symbolism is used to distinguish the characters as belonging and not belonging, which links into the contextual themes of being the other in both these novels due to slavery in Beloved and due to the status of women in Dracula. In both these novels, it is further used to contrast between different ideas and messages, like the good versus evil dichotomy in Dracula and slavery and morality in Beloved, and to act as a wider social message. Symbolism is frequently employed in particularly poignant moments, and both Beloved and Dracula remain vivid in the reader's mind long after completion due to the effectiveness of the symbol chosen by Toni Morrison and Bram Stoker. Okay, so a couple of things that are good first. Well, uh, within this intro, it's clear straight away what the question is. Because my first sentence is, in both Beloved and Dracula, symbolism is frequently made use in order to. So, the examiner straight away knows that I have chosen to answer the question on symbolism and it's very good to have as your first sentence the name of the text uh, and something to do with the question and then right after in order to where you actually say why they use symbolism. So I noticed that in a lot of intros they're very general and it, you kind of have this feeling that um, the people who wrote these intros, they just learned them, and it's a general intro which they're using to apply to every essay, and it's like, in names of your chosen works, XYZ is done because this, 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 XYZ, 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 and it's just general sentences that are kind of 
vaguely about themes and languages and that is not what your intro is about it shouldn't be about waffling it should be getting straight to the point and actually explaining what you will be talking about your essay and it should also be something that the examiner can come back to and be like oh right that's what their essay is about notice also how i basically all of the points that i mentioned in my planning they're written here in the intro uh, so your intro really needs to lay it all out but i added a few things a few general things that i didn't add in my plan uh the ways that it links into themes for example and also a few notes on context. Once again, to show that I'm aware of all of the assessment objectives. My intro here does everything that an intro is supposed to do. I'm gonna admit it's not the greatest intro ever written. It's very clear that like it's just firstly, secondly, thirdly, it's listing all this out without actually saying firstly, secondly, thirdly. It could have been written better, but again, your intro is not supposed to be like the greatest intro that has ever been written. It's just supposed to introduce and it's supposed to do it in a way that doesn't waffle and get straight to the point. And honestly, within the time constraints, this is all right. Uh, in fact, a comment from my English literature professor was that she thinks that I could have actually just cut it out if I was struggling with time constraints, but with time constraints here I struggled somewhere in the middle where I lost my chain of thought, so the intro was not the problem. Alright, body one. One way in which the writers make use of symbolism is in order to distinguish the characters of their novels as the other. In Dracula, Mina's le Mina is left with a mark on her forehead when Van Helsing touches her with the holy vapor. This, distinct this disfigures her pure skin and makes her visibly not belong, as she had been darkened by the forces of evil represented by the Count. In Beloved, similarly says he's separated by her status of being a former slave. She's marked by the chokehold cherry tree on her back, her scars from being whipped. Like Mina, these physical marks made these two women visibly different. They're no longer able to be perceived as everyone else, the symbolism highlights their moral status too. For Ceci in particular, her scars show that she will always be a former slave. She will never move away from that status, which holds particular relevance, as Beloved is set during the Reconstruction period, when there was a lot of uncertainty as to the new status of Black people, and there continued to be segregation, not only inter-race, but intra-race. A former slave was below a Black citizen who was below a white citizen. Ceci cherry tree which runs down her back highlights this. It's interesting that it is not Seti who sees it as a tree, but Amy. That's what she called it. I've never seen it and never will, because Seti's perception of her status is irrelevant. What matters is how others perceive her. This is similarly the case with Mina's forehead being seared and her covering the mark with a hat. The symbolism of a tree is also significant, as it shows that slavery has deep roots in American culture. It is deeply ingrained in the history of the US and in the attitudes of the people. Seti cannot be free from their perceptions, even if she's legally free. Likewise, Mina's mark on her forehead has relevance to Dracula's context too, the perception of women at the time. Like with slavery, perceptions didn't change when lost did, and women were still perceived as lesser citizens, and the status of the new woman and the fallen woman were especially disliked compared to the angel in the house, a woman's tradition and family home role. The new woman was seen to be too man-like, and the fallen woman too sexual. Mina's mark represents the stain on her virginity as she engaged in sex, an illusion um, made through the count drinking her blood while unmarried, even though she did not consent and was forced to drink like a kitten. Symbolism is thus used uh, to distinguish the characters as alienated in their text because of race and beloved and gender in Dracula. So at the beginning of this very long point, <laughs> Yeah, you see, it's very long, and I would say that at times, I don't think it's too long, but the paragraphing is always a problem for me, um, because it's only here that it seems, well, it already seems quite long, but on paper, it's often that I write a page without a single paragraph break, which is not really good, and I would advise you against it. Um, I would advise you, of course, to kind of, with every new sub-point in your point, to have a paragraph. It's just that I often get carried away. Um, within this first part of this long point, there is a sentence-by-sentence -sentence comparison. So I say, Beloved is this, Dracula is this. That part is very good, but as the point progresses, this part kind of thins out and it begins to be very long chunks of text about a single work. Um, when you get to the context, I think it's slightly inevitable. You can't just do with one sentence uh, for each or two sentences for each, but this is something that you slightly need to control. It shouldn't just be that you have a 
a paragraph about one text, a paragraph about the other, at least a few phrases within that one paragraph should be about the other work because it's an integrated comparison. But here I also see that I managed to mention context and I also managed to actually make use of the point and reference what symbolism is, which is something that I actually didn't do in the introduction, which I probably should have. So you should define the question a little bit and show that you understand, but I think it also shows that even if you don't do it in the introduction, as long as you make it clear in your actual body paragraphs, it's not that much of a problem. I think here this is a good structure in terms of the point. I have the point, the evidence, the evaluation, and the link. The link comes at the very end. This phrase, symbolism is thus used to distinguish the characters as alienated. That goes back to the question that reminds the examiner that that was the whole entire reason why I wrote the super long paragraph. For me, I think that this evaluation is missing the question of why is the other so important? Because I talk a lot about how they're the other, but I don't really talk about the social consequences. Okay, so Sethi is separated. Okay, so she's not as good as another citizen. Why is that bad? I could have talked about the moral implications, the fact that they're poor, the fact that it's difficult to find work. I could have talked about how in Victorian prejudices, that's it. If you if you had sex outside of marriage, you could be disowned by your family, you could be like you could be shunned and you would never marry and you would live either destitute your whole life or turn to prostitution. But this is not mentioned. And another point that could have been expanded was the fact that I talked about how Sethi's scar is in the eyes of the beholder, uh, so it's not her who describes it as a cherry tree. Uh, I did talk about this, but I think it should have been it would have been better if I compared the fact that Mina's mark is visible and it's visible by other people, whereas Sethi's mark is known by other people but it's not visible because it's on her back under her clothes. So for Mina, there's a scene where the villagers see her and so she's forced to cover the hat on her forehead a bit more and she feels the sense of shame. And in general, this sense of shame that people feel that's associated with the other could have been explored more. And these are all things that an examiner might think when they're reading your work. So what could have been done better and what needs have been met. Um, this what could have been done better part, they don't take marks off of you if you don't say something, it's just that the examiner is constantly asking themselves why you said this, okay why is it like that? Uh, the symbol makes, set, makes Mina the other, why is it like that? Well it's because people can see that she has been marked by something supernatural. Why is that important? Because she is then shunned. Why is that important? And so on and so on. So there needs to be like a certain linking chain throughout the work, which you need to uphold in order to have an effective assessment objective to your evaluation. But it's also the thread that holds your AO1 together, which is the quality of your essay writing. Symbolism is further used to show abstract ideas and contrast between different themes in the novels. Thessie's cherry tree symbolism is part of a larger symbolism of trees recurrent through the novel, just as Mina's mark is part of a long allusion to forces of darkness to the figure of wolves. In Beloved, trees act as a symbol for healing, which is why the language is twisted by the horrors and darkness of their context, such as the cherry tree being choke hold on Sethi's back. The choice of the word choke has connotations of asphyxiation, claustrophobia, imminent death. Sethi cannot escape the scars on her back any more than she can escape slavery. Similarly, Mina cannot escape her status of being corrupted by her encounter with Dracula, which is why she clutches at her forehead in desperation and cries out at being unclean. She says that even the Almighty shuns my polluted flesh. The use of the verb shuns emphasizes that she is avoided, rejected through fear of co contamination, evidenced through the use of polluted. She views herself as having contracted the disease of uncleanliness that is so dire that even God does not mourn her. God is presented as a figure who is all forgiving, and so the use of even demonstrates that in her eyes she is so far gone that she is beyond forgiveness by the most forgiving of forces. She is unable to separate herself from her sin, and likewise the beauty of Sweet Home Plantation is unable to be distinguished from its horrors. It's ironically named sweet home, which only highlights the terrible conditions of slavery that are far from sweet. Furthermore, Sethi remarks that it had the most beautiful sycamore trees, but then corrupts this beauty by saying there were boys hanging from those trees. She attempts to focus on the beauty in an attempt to remove the trauma and disguise the true horrors as a coping mechanism and a way to move on. The trees, which were previously a symbol of beauty and growth, take on the meaning of trauma and brutality, especially as they later serve as the site of further lynchings and burnings. Likewise, there's a recurring symbol of darkness and 
despair in Dracula to wolves. Wolves symbolize evil and corruption. Jonathan cannot escape their howling, while Dracula enjoys the song of the children of the night. Jonathan is shaking, and the symbolism highlights the difference between the two. The wolves demonstrate savagery and the animalistic nature of Dracula, which is also seen through his physiognomy, his aquiline features. Wolves are a recurring symbol to dark Dracula representing darkness and the forces of evil, which are contrasted to the forces of good and the purity of Nina's forehead, which is why upon killing Dracula, the snow is not more pure than her forehead. In Beloved, trees act as a recurring symbol which demonstrates the contrast between beauty and rightness and the atrocities of slavery, represented by the violence and the change in the language of war. Okay, first of all, it's the fact that I'm heavily breathing even after reading this. I can't imagine what the examiner would feel if they just saw this, which has no, you know, not a single paragraph break, and this was a very long chunk of text. Um, this paragraph is slightly better in terms of the usage of quotes. There are a lot more quotes, and there's also a lot more comparison here too. I would say that um, one thing that I also should have mentioned in body one is that ideally after using a quote you say the page from which you've gone on the quote. I have no idea why it's missing here when all of my other essays had it. I guess I was just rushing to complete this one. But yeah, that part is really important. Um, I understand that sometimes you learn the quotes, but even if you learn the quotes, at least if you just say like chapter five, um, it's still better than just using the quote and not explaining where it's from, but this is like a pedantic thing. Um, also, I would say that for this one, the point is not entirely clear and the paragraph is missing a link, so at the end there's no linking sentence as with body paragraph one uh, that kind of linked back to the question. So I talked a lot about symbolism, but it's not clear what the point here was because I think the overarching theme in this particular paragraph just was not clear. Because if you look at it, right, I talked about this, uh, this like symbol of darkness and despair. I talked about the symbolism of trees, but then I also managed to fit in this like irony of calling sweet hope sweet home and the choice of the word choke on Sethi's back. Um, it's good that I managed to fit it in because this point I think went through the most assessment objectives. Also, there's a feeling here that I was jumping a little bit from topic to topic and really desperately trying to cover it and this part comes from poor planning and the reason that I say this is because when I started this point I realized I actually didn't have a point and this sometimes happens so it's better if in the planning stage you spend more time to make sure that you have that title point only if it's a point that actually you know has things worth making. I think I managed to save it here and just kind of woeful my way through by analyzing relevant things to the question, but you can tell straight away that it's not structured as well as the first paragraph, and probably it doesn't it doesn't do great in terms of AO1 structure of essay, because although it flows well, it quite literally jumps from one thing to another. But that's if I'm being critical. Other than that, I would say that I do think the point is good, because Things like the choice of the word choke has connotations and like the use of the verb shuns. These are all linguistic points that are very good because they show that you are not just analyzing about what happens in the novel and why this is important, but that you're analyzing from a technical perspective. And I actually think that this is a really big advantage of choosing technical questions like this one rather than thematic questions. So it depends on your strong suits, but I personally prefer to go for a technical question if it's about things like symbolism and for a thematic question if it's about like very specific technical aspects that I'm not sure on, about how to answer. But symbolism is just one of those things where you can really cover everything, which makes it a gift of a question. Furthermore, symbolism is used by the writers to draw attention to poignant moments. For example, when Lucy is bitten by the Count, the symbolism of the moon in that scene in Dracula, and when the men steal Sethi's milk while Hallie is watching in Beloved. The efficacy of these symbols add particular vividness to these scenes, make the scene vibrant in the reader's mind long after completion of the novels. In Dracula, this is done through the effective pathetic fallacy of the pure moon over the King Lucy's figure. The moon struck a half-reclining figure. The use of the verb struck suggests an 
assault a palpable hit, and this is representative of Lucy being likewise tempted into sexual relations with Dracula as she has been led astray. When Mina looks out, there was a bright full moon with heavy black driving clouds, which threw the whole scene into a fleeting diorama of light and shade as they sailed across. The whiteness of the full moon represents Lucy's innocence and virginity, while the heavy clouds threatening to overtake it are the forces of evil, with black's connotation of darkness and evil. Light and shade represent the theme of the struggle of good versus evil prominent in the novel, and within this scene the symbolism of the moon acts as a pathetic fallacy to explain how Lucy's virginity has been corrupted by the Count. There is a similarly vivid description in Beloved, with the color white of the milk that is taken from Sethi. Sethi is fixated on being able to nurse her baby on her own, as she recounts her own childhood when the little white babies got it first, and I got what was left. She's determined to give milk to her own child, because she know what it is to be without the milk that belongs to you, to have to fight and holler for it, and to have so little left. The milk is a symbol of liberty and human rights. The white represents innocence and the purity of humanity, but her the purity of humanity, but her milk is taken away by the white nephews of the school teacher. She has to fight and holler to be treated as a human, but instead her liberty, just like her milk, is repeatedly taken away. That is why Sethi's proudest moment is when she get it to her, to beloved, even after they stole it, even after the white nephews forcibly hold her down and take it. The milk acts as a symbol of not only liberty, but also of mother's love. Sethi directly addresses Beloved, recounting to her that I walked right on by because only me had your milk and God do what he would, I was gonna get it to you. She walks past the body of a friend hanging in the trees, but she has only one goal, to deliver milk. She hopes Beloved will be born into a better future, a future where milk can be accessed by her and not by white babies, which is why it is so particularly heartbreaking when Sethi kills Beloved due to not wanting her to grow up in enslavement. In both novels, white has connotations of purity and innocence, and the corruption of these symbols adds poignancy to the scenes. Here you can definitely see that by the end I was slightly rushing to finish the point um, because I was running out of time. The other thing is that the because I was rushing, you can see that I started to lose slip on the actual comparison part. The end is pretty much like what five sentences about purely beloved and you know reference to Dracula. That one final link feels like I wrote it in 15 seconds before trying to move on to the conclusion. Um, in general, I would say that if you're running out of time, it's better to have a conclusion be like one sentence long or to just not bother because you actually got to finish your point. But here I tried to do both and I like it's up to you to think about how well I managed to do it. I will talk about the conclusion in a second. Um, here I would say that an issue with this point is that although the point is good and I talk more about symbolism and I talk about my response to it, which is also good because it adds that level of personal response and shows that I'm not just purely analyzing either that I'm actually looking at how the book makes me feel um, without even once saying I, because this is super important, you should not be writing I in your essay. Uh, the point here is about poignancy, and I think it's clear what I meant by poignancy when you read it, but the reader shouldn't have to assume that they understand what I mean. So at the beginning, I really should have talked about what poignancy is and what makes a moment poignant. But I talked here about things like mother's love that made it clear. But this is just something that could have been done better. But other than that, I would say that this point, even if it's not perfect, it manages to stay on the question. And in general, with all of the points that I had, all of the three points, I'm criticizing them now to show you that this is not the ideal essay. But the fact that they managed to at least stay on topic with the question, even if they weren't organized, is what I think got this essay up to the top band and gave it the top marks. Um, so that's something that you should try to emulate in your own essays too. And finally, the conclusion. This, thus, in both Beloved and Dracula, symbolism is frequently made use of in order to emphasize emotional moments, distinguish characters, and reference abstract ideas and themes that are recurrent throughout the novels. The symbolism of wolves, trees, milk, the moon, all serve not only for aesthetic purposes, but to drive and advance the narrative. And ultimately, symbolism is key to the construction of both these novels. Both Beloved and Dracula are set during difficult periods, the reconstruction period for Beloved and the xenophobic prejudices of the Victorian times for Dracula. And Symbolism is made use of to criticize and draw attention to the iniquities of the period, but also the beauty of these settings as Sethi remains a symbol of resilience and Mina ultimately a symbol of purity that overcomes the corruption threatening to overtake her.
So in this conclusion, I once again repeat the main points that I had, but notice that I'm not repeating them in the same way that I did in the intro. I'm giving more detail and I'm wrapping up kind of the main idea all that I had in each paragraph and throughout all this I'm accentuating that I met the assessment objectives so abstract ideas and themes take uh, the, the thematic part of the analysis because they often say to focus on themes in the question and then like symbolism of Wall Street's milk the, not for aesthetic purposes but to drive an advanced narrative take writer's craft right evaluation uh, both beloved are set in the in the period that they're set take contextual information and then of course the fact that I have this conclusion kind of wraps the essay up and it feeds into AO1, which is how I argue and how I present information. So I would say it is better to have a conclusion if you can afford it without losing your final point. But timing is just something that you need to work on more and more. And the more practice essays that you write, the more that timing will become easier for you. Yeah, honestly, with conclusion, just the single role is to not make any new points, but to still somehow manage to say something interesting in your conclusion without just repeating and rephrasing your introduction. I think the interesting point here was that Sethi and Lena are also ultimately a symbol of resilience which is something that I hinted at throughout the entirety of my essay, but never directly explicitly stated it. So this line serves as kind of a, oh, yeah, that's right, that's an interesting thought, and oh, she kind of said that somewhere. So it serves to connect and to link that part of the essay. So for the examiner, I think it makes it really important if they can see in the conclusion that you met all those assessment objectives, and at the same time, it wasn't just a rephrasing of your entire essay, but that's the point of a conclusion after all, it's to conclude what you have been saying and the ways that it answered the question. So I really hope that this has been helpful uh, and that you understand more about what the exam is like and what you're supposed to do, and even if you're not doing the at Excel exam board, you can see what's the sort of essay that you might need to produce, and you can also see that it's not perfect and where it can be improved. So hopefully you can write a far a far better essay than I did here. So yeah, I really hope that you enjoyed the video, and if this was helpful, please, please, please leave a like and comment, as th that means that this video will reach more people. So thank you so much for watching, and see you soon. Thank you.